Kia ora and welcome to season two of the Influencers at Lincoln University podcast series. Today I have with me Dr. Nicholas Prince, who is a lecturer in agricultural systems management here in the Faculty of Agribusiness and Commerce. Welcome, Nick. Hello, Hafsa. Thank you. So Nick came to Lincoln in April 2019, having worked previously in agricultural and rural land use consultancy in the UK. Prior to this, he worked in academic institutions in Scotland and England, lecturing on land use, agriculture, rural policy and environmental management. His academic background focused mainly on land use and property relationship, and he currently operates as a course advisor for the diplomas in agriculture and farm management here at Lincoln University. So Nick, given your background, you come into academic research with something of a different perspective. Do you want to talk to us more about that? Yes, thanks. Um, Yes, I probably do. Um, I'm very much coming at it from a farmer's perspective, um, given my background in agricultural production and consultancy and education as well. I'm sort of very much focused on um, the impact of influences on the farmer um, and the farming um, industry, the agricultural industry. Um, And there's a huge range of issues, of course, that, that sort of impacting on farmers. Um, but coming from the UK, then policy is is very high on the list. Um, so at the current time, I have a paper um, in review that's sort of looking at the impact of different policies on new entrants to the agricultural industry. And um, unfortunately, it makes quite depressing reading for um, new entrants um, to the industry because of the, the impact of the variety of policies and regulatory influences that are out there. And of course, the sort of the economic um, implications of establishing yourself um, within the industry. And I think there's sort of two questions that I'm sort of looking to follow up on um, from this paper. And the first of those is, you know, is defining the future strategies to sort of help new entrants into the, um, the agricultural industry. And I think the sort of second part very much informs this and it's what new entrants to the industry act- actually need. And I think we sort of, certainly within a, um, a UK and a European context, we have this perception that new entrants require property. Um, so they need some land to, to, to farm on, they need some buildings to sort of help that production system and they probably ideally want a residential property on the farm as well. But I think given the changes in the agricultural industry, there's sort of a real questing about whether that's sort of actually what new entrants um, require. So working with colleagues here at Lincoln. Um, we've got a project ongoing at the moment where we've gone out, we've talked to um, industry contacts and we said, hey guys, what are the issues that are sort of facing the um, new entrants? And then we've used this research to sort of inform a second phase of research. And this is going out to those who are sort of recently established in the agricultural industry um, and assessing their views and sort of experiences um, to sort of determine what they require or what, what support they would have um, liked to have been in place um, within the uh, within the industry to sort of help their transition um, and sort of progression um, within the industry as well. Um, and I think, you know, coming from the UK, then sort of a different uh, political environment to what we have here in um, New Zealand. Um, so it's been very interesting sort of exploring that. And I think particularly maybe the New Zealand dairy sector gives a very good indication of how you can have a structured um, career pathway um, to a sort mm-hmm. of enable people now whether we can do that in sort of sheep and beef production and um, the other production systems um, is maybe a little bit more of a challenge but yeah that's sort of certainly uh, an interesting area that I uh, am very interested in um, and it's sort of very relevant to my role here at Lincoln. Mm. So that is very interesting stuff that you've talked about in terms of how the political differences you know and you've noticed that the political differences do have an impact. So, um, and I noticed that you mentioned the impact of um, the influences, again, on the agricultural industry. Uh, do, do these differ from those facing individual businesses that you've got, that you've looked at? Um, no, I think they're intrinsically linked. Um, but, you know, they're sort of... Um, the influence is, 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 is in different areas. And let me give you an example. You know, we've got the sort of the current debates around um, livestock production, um, climate change, we've got sort of the impact of environmental concerns as well alongside this. Um, and, you know, these are challenges that the whole industry has to address. Um, and, the, you know, the industry is working um, to sort of understand how to sort of um, mitigate these, um, these factors um, and how we can sort of work towards um, 
diminishing the impact um, of them. But at the same time, farmers have to react at the individual level. So at the farm, mm -hmm. um, they have to adapt their own management strategies um, and they have to sort of, um, you know, how do they implement these to, to bring about change? And to me, this sort of promotes the significance of education. Um, you know, how do we um, support farmers and the individual businesses that they have um, to be able to bring about this change? And there's a lot of good work going out there in the industry. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Um, but as a sort of an educational institution, we can support that and we can help sort of this development and allow um farmers to develop the strategies that they need to do alongside this i think there's also a gap between the producers and the consumers um and if i put my farming hat on if i put my farmers um, approach to this it's very much well you know society doesn't understand what farmers are doing they don't understand what we have to do to produce food and hey there may be a little bit of something in that um you know and i've certainly for one i would like to see um, agriculture and food back in the um, the curriculum um at school so you know we start to understand um, the implications of agriculture and food at, at an early age. And we've seen within COVID the sort of the significance, particularly within New Zealand, um, of agriculture within the economy. So there's some real issues there that, you know, that are very, very important. At the same time as this, then farmers can't ignore social concerns towards current farming practices and they need to engage um, with the consumers to understand what the consumer wants. And um, having talked to contacts in the industry, I think there's, you know, there's a real groundswell of um, desire from farmers to want to be able to do this and, and maybe the framework to enable this to happen and that feedback system. Mm -hmm. um, between producer and consumers um, could be improved. So um, another area of sort of research I'm interested in at the moment is looking at the, the social license, um, whereby the social license is the, you know, the acceptance that society gives to farmers to continue their production. Um, and so how we can maintain this. And I think the horticultural industry provides a particularly good case study of this um, because, you know, um, selling a bottle of wine, I think it's a very good example. You buy a bottle of wine, you look at the, um, the label, and you sold this story, um, mm. and you often sort of you <clears throat> romantic images, um, and I think it's certainly something that uh, that agricultural production could um, could learn from as well to sort of you know to engage. Um, to sell the story and to explain to people what's happening, but also to, you know, to implement those changes that are required within the production mm. systems as well. Mm. Because uh, certainly what you mentioned is very valuable in terms of that conversation between producers and consumers and that kind of a two-way educational relationship mm -hmm. to build that uh, better understanding. And I really like the idea of that social license. It's very interesting. So my be worth catching up with you again sometime absolutely no no it's interesting so <laughs> so you've obviously got an interest in research that can benefit individual farmers and the wider agriculture and horticulture sectors do you feel that these areas receive enough academic attention though <laughs> no um, I don't and I think you know there's a reason for that there's sort of the basic agricultural production approach whereby we take the soil we 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 put things into the soil and we grow produce and um, be it crops or um <coughs> excuse me or, or we uh, real livestock and then that concept basically hasn't changed for quite some time um, and where research has been has been sort of looking at the impact of policy of climate change of all the different things on the, the producer and um, in terms of the actual farmer then the, the sort of the process has been on efficiency and how we can improve efficiency um, and how we can generate sort of additional outputs um, from land as well. And that's very much sort of coming in at it from the European perspective, the sort of the, the multifunctional um, approach. But one of the things um, I think the sort of the current debate in um, academia at the moment um, and in the industry is about regenerative agriculture um, and how regenerative agriculture can be sort of used to, to be create a more sustainable um, industry. And I think that's great. And, you know, there's farmers going out there that are doing the trying things and they're not waiting for science to get on there and they're trying their own things. And, hey, that's, that, that's brilliant. And, you know, hopefully that there's a lot of good comes out of it. But one of the problems we have, we, you know, we're talking about regenerative agriculture. We, we're comparing New Zealand to, to Australia. We're comparing New Zealand to um, the United States. And we've got quite different production systems here. And there doesn't seem to be a sort of a differential for the, the types of production on farms. You know, in New Zealand, you've got pastoral production. Um, animals are outside for the whole of the year. And, you know, so it's completely different to the sort of the, the forage-based um, cut and carry approach, maybe, that we have um, in the United States, that we have in parts of Europe as well. So it, 
there's a lot of issues when we're trying to compare these different systems. And I've been talking to colleagues in the UK recently, and we find it really difficult to, um, to sort of try and determine the similarities and difference between production systems. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, the ways we can do this is sort of often based on um, economic performance figures, which are readily available. But in other ways, it's, it's difficult to sort of determine the the individual processes so i think that's a real issue and um, that we have that we you know we that we don't differentiate different production systems um, and I know New Zealand agriculture is very much trying to do that and promote this sort of pastoral um, approach that we have so I think that's something that we need to do um, academically um, you know, we, we talk about technology, we talk about innovation, um, and these things have gone on, and they, they are creating um, new production systems, and they're improving production systems, and so there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, but, um, you know, I think implementation of the essential freshwater package in New Zealand um, is, a, is a sort of a real indication of why we need to focus on, on, the, on the farmer. Um, you know, we've got this this package that's come in. It's an environmental um, objective regulation, and farmers have to respond to it. And it's farmers have gone along for years, and they've been producing, and they've been very good at producing. Then all of a sudden, there's a complete different approach um, from regulation, and farmers go, "Whoa, you know, how do we cope with this?" Um, and so, as researchers, we need to sort of look at, at, at different systems around the globe and sort of say, "Well, how do people implement change?" Um, what's a sort of a realistic time frame for implementing change? What structural frameworks do people need to help them implement change? And I know there's a lot of good work going out in the industry where farmers are supporting each other um, through beef and lamb and different initiatives like that, where, you know, there's a lot of support there, farmer. But it is very much a learning process. And I think there's a feedback here to regulators to, to understand that, you know, farmers want to change, farmers want to implement change, but they need the support framework to do it. Um, so I think that's sort of something that, you know, certainly as an academic that I would want to um, sort of touch upon um, even more about how we, you know, sort of implement um, that change. And of course, that comes down to, um, you know, institutions like Lincoln. How do we sort of support that change? How do we um, instill that approach into students as well as we go? So we need to learn from that point of view as well so that, you know, we can help um, train the farmers of the futures to be able to um, get into that position to implement change. Mm. So there's some very interesting comments you made about the idea that changes, um, you know, in terms of the implementation of change. And and again, through the, um, through the, con through the um, response that you've given me, the emphasis is again on education. So education seems to be a consistent approach. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm very, you know, as if you go into a sector, you get a career, um, you're always doing CPD. You know, we, we, the agricultural industry, farmers come out of college out of university and off the go and there isn't that support network you know people in the in the support industry so the the the, the seed merchants the consultants and um, the bankers these guys will all be doing cpd and mm -hmm. um, whereas the agricultural industry is very much okay off you go you're a farmer now and you know the industry is getting much better now at sort of saying well actually we need we need assistance in the working and uh, you know there's different projects out there where farmers mm -hmm. come together and they develop the skills uh, but it's been very slow, um, you know, and, and, and so this is certainly something that's required around, um, you know, environmental issues as well uh, to sort of we need some help. How do we implement these changes? How do we go about it? Um, so, yeah, I think education is very much, uh, very much a key part of it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So continuing on those lines and you've spoken about your research um about how you want to use your research to inform teaching and i and i know that you're interested in mental well-being in the rural sector and that definitely did come through partly in the conversation we've had could you just explain a little bit more about this mental well-being in the rural sector idea yeah no absolutely you know and like you say this is very much something that's come through as my role of as, as a lecturer you know we're preparing students for a career in rural industries um, and we know that rural industries have a high level of, of, of well-being issues and, you know, that's becoming more and more um, mainstream. And there's been a real issue of, of, you know, of talking about this within the industry um, in particular around men. You know, I'm a man. I don't suffer these things and we've sort of got to engage with it. But, you know, the students that we are sending out at some point in their career, it's likely that either themselves or the, the family and um, the friends, the colleagues, the neighbours um, within the management of a business, they will have to deal with um, mental well-being issues. Um, so what we're trying to do is just uh, prepare the students for this and create a, a sort of a... Um, 
mental well-being awareness at the university and you know hopefully the students can then take this out and this can go out into the wider sector and that just you know it's okay to talk to people about this it's okay to you know not be okay i guess is the is the message here and and so working with colleagues at the moment we're sort of looking at how we can develop this and sort of embed it within other, the teaching that we do um, and then sort of looking at ways that we can you know take it from lincoln um, as a sort of a support service to the industry and how it got, sort of goes out from Lincoln um, to the benefit of the wider industry. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a real issue, um, particularly in terms of um, rural sectors. Mm. So, Yeah, excellent stuff, Nick. I think that gives us enough to get, to get people to get in touch with you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Nick. So if you're wanting to get in touch with Nick, you can contact him and find his details on Lincoln University's staff profile. Or you can email him at nicholas.prince at lincoln.ac.nz. And as for me, I'll be back again with another episode of Influences at LU. Another uh, interesting topic for us to discuss. If you do have any feedback, you can send that through to me at hafsa.ahmed at lincoln.ac.nz or message me on LinkedIn. Kakite. <laughs>